This episode of Tea with Jules is proudly brought to you by The Home. You can shop any of the items you see in this episode at thehome.com.au. John, I, I've, I've actually probably never been more excited to sit in my own chair and talk to a person before. Well, I'm very excited to be here, Jules. Uh, you know, it's not often that you get to meet someone who is out and about interviewing a whole lot of different people. No, no, no. This is not about me. This is this is all about you today. I am on, I'm under the spotlight. I'm on your couch. We're drinking tea. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you are a psychologist. Yes. Yes. You are a relationship expert. Yep. And you are an author. You've written three books. You're a father. Yep. You're a husband. Yeah. Which is good when you're a relationship ship's expert. It doesn't mean that I don't get things wrong at home. My no, wife no. would certainly uh, say sh- I make mistakes. Uh, I have got so many questions on yeah. that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> first of all, this is tea with Jules. Do you drink tea? Love my tea. Yeah. Yep. I'll have a little peppermint every now and then just before uh, I sit down and watch the TV. Yes. Love it. Yep. Now, um, the thing that we're all going on about right now is the show that you're currently doing which is yeah. Married at First Sight. Now, you're, you're one of the experts on the show. Yes. That have put these couples together and they get married at first sight. That's right. I, I can relate to this on zero level because <laughs> I dated my husband for eight years before yeah. we got married and I knew him for six years yeah. before we dated. So... Being married at first sight, I just, I, I cannot conceive of the idea. Yeah, so the way you did it, with all the challenges uh, that you and Guy had, we basically take all of those challenges and we throw them at our participants over an eight-week period. So yeah. it's an accelerated, intense pressure cooker for them. Oh, yeah. Uh, meeting the family, uh, trying to get along with friends, mm-hmm. um, deciding how to navigate intimacy in the relationship. Uh, will they move for love? Mm-hmm. How they get on with the group? Mm-hmm. There's so many things that they have to try and figure out in such a short period of time that, like you say, you or me with my wife, we get a lot of time to really get to know the person to decide whether we want to move forward. In this, really, they've got very little time. Yes. Mm. And there's so much drama. There is huge amounts of drama. And I, you know, I still am surprised by what the people do. And we're into series four now. I mean, One of the things we found is that there's so many variables that go into whether or not they make it above and beyond the science that we just do what we can to put them together as best as we can with their compatibility and then we just have to sit back and watch what happens. Mm -hmm. The experts have been under fire. Oh, yeah. In particular is they've come to the commitment ceremony where they have to say they're going to stay or they're going to leave. That's right. And then they turn the tables on you guys and ask the question, why did you match us? What's going on? That's right. So, you know, when we're in a relationship, we will often, you know, because we're keen on the person and we want that person to be in our lives, we'll take some responsibility, we'll look at ourselves and try and work through it. But in the experiment, what we found with a lot of the couples is that when things start to break down, rather than them saying, you know, how do we do this differently? They just go, John, you're a fraud. There's no science in this. Why did you match us? Mm -hmm. And so they lash out at the experts. Uh, And that's something that we didn't really see coming until this series. But it's been good because it's made us accountable. Mm. And, you know, it puts us on our toes uh, because we can't coast along at any stage. They want answers and they want help. Yeah. Have you watched the whole kind of series unfold and then look at some of the couples that have been matched and thought well, maybe they're not matched after all. <laughs> That's right, Jules. <laughs> You're so diplomatic. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. I mean, you can tell pretty early on with couples how mm-hmm. they're going to go. The couples that stay together, side together, that's pretty much what I've learnt through this whole experience. And when they hit their first couple of challenges, uh, if, they, if they start to blame, if they start to turn away from one another, give the cold shoulder they start to bad mouth or belittle them in front of the group, you know that they're probably not going to last. Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of sex, intimacy, that sort of stuff, you know, they all go at different paces. So some are a slow burn and then they catch a light. Others are hot and heavy early on. 
that's not such a big deal. It's more kind of how they navigate the conflict and how they have each other's backs. Mm. You guys are so good at, at articulating it because we're just screaming at the TV. <laughs> that's right. Or like we can, we've got no words and you guys are like, oh, yeah. no, now he's feeling this way. Yeah. You're so calm and can well, say it in you know, the best way. Th there are times where we do, do lose it. But it's funny you say that because I wasn't ever sure whether this show was going to be successful. And I remember watching the first episode with my wife and she had a whole lot of girlfriends over there. And I was just sitting there quietly. And they were screaming at the TV set. <laughs> and I remember thinking, wow, that's, that's a weird reaction to be so invested in yeah. what's going on here. This might be something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's carried on right the way through. The oh, people yeah. get really you know, wound up by it. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about yourself and yeah. your background and... Well, now and... I'm going to squirt. <laughs> don't, don't worry. <laughs> it's not that heavy. What made you want to get into psychology in the first place? Was it something mm. you were always interested in? Basically, I was a cricket player when I was going through university. Okay. And uh, I played kind of first class cricket for a while. And this was back in New Zealand uh, where I met my wife. Uh, but I am an Aussie. And... Um, I was really into sports psychology. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'll just play cricket and do sports psychology. Uh, and then I started to get really interested in clinical psychology, couples, um, just, you know, generally people's mental health. Mm -hmm. And um, so I left sports psychology behind and went down the path of clinical. And couple wise, you know, it was, it's strange, but my wife, you know, she would have friends that would come over and they'd talk about the relationship problems. And for some strange reason, I'd be very interested in that. <laughs> and I think I've just kind of always been really curious about mm. how relationships work. And mm. so I've kind of gone into that full time. At what point along your career journey did you get married and start your own family? Okay, so I met my wife um, about... 12 years ago. We were in New Zealand at the time and I'd done some documentaries over there and she was a newsreader and a, and a presenter. And so she had a big profile over there and I was kind of this kind of weird psychologist that she'd met and <laughs> she'd take me to premieres and stuff. And, and so we were kind of getting a bit more known, uh, but we got to a point where we uh, had had enough and we wanted to jump into a bigger market. And so we packed up and moved to Australia. I got married 10 years ago this year, and um, January. And uh, so we kind of started our family once we moved to Australia. For us, it was a big risk, kind of, because New Zealand was, uh, it was very safe. She had family there. Um, she was in the media. We could have just stayed there. Mm. But we decided to give that all away and, and go to a bigger pond. Mm -hmm. And it was the best thing we'd ever done, but it's probably the hardest thing we've done. Yeah, the risk paid off. It really did, yeah, yeah. And she's loving it, and, and I'm having a, a great time. I'm cool. getting a talk with you, Jules. <laughs> well, I mean, what could be better? You know? <laughs> You're very charming. <laughs> My background is styling and fashion stylist. Yes. So that's your profession. You're, you're a stylist. You have to look good. Oh, yeah. Your right. pressure is I'm a relationships yep. expert and I'm married. That's right. So I need to be perfect that's right. at this. That's right. Uh, Discuss. Well, yes. When I married my wife, she said, John, uh, let's just get this clear. I want a husband, not a therapist. So mm -hmm. she said, cut the psycho babble. I don't want to hear it. Did, were you doing that? Well, maybe I probably did early on, uh, but not for long. Yeah. Okay. She just said, no, that's not going to work. And I'm glad she did that. Uh, so I'm not perfect. Absolutely not perfect. Uh, so I'll make mistakes. Um, and, you know, because we've all got buttons and when we're in intimate relationships, they get hit. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we have our moments. But I think when you're, when you're a good couple, a couple that's kind of healthy, you repair quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Kelly and I do really well. We kind of, um, we know when things aren't quite, uh, haven't gone well and we repair quickly. I think also the way we talk, um, you know, we try and bring things up relatively softly rather than with a sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are some of the things that, you know, and I'll say to my clients in, in a session, I'll say, look, nothing I'm telling you to do, I wouldn't do with my wife, you right. know? So these strategies, strategies that make couples happy, basically, they're very, they're science-based, but they're little ones and they make a big difference. And so I try my best to do those with Kells, but also, you know, when I'm, when I'm giving out advice to the public or with, with couples, 
So I don't feel that pressure so much because mm. I just think, oh, you know, I'm human. Yeah. You know, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I won't. Yeah. Um, but I do take responsibility. I'm good at saying sorry. That's really good. Because I, you know, I do make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know it's what? That, it's amazing how it takes the sting out of everything. Where you yeah. say, "I'm sorry," full mm -hmm. stop. Mm -hmm. I need to work on that. <laughs> Guy's really good at that. Is he? Yeah. He's very emotionally intelligent. So, what would you say? And this is a, I mean, very general yeah. sort of a question. And this is one for the viewers that are tuning mm -hmm. in that might want to apply some advice into their own relationships. Yes. Yes. What would you say are some I guess some hot tips on having a successful relationship. Yes. Well, there are certain things that mm -hmm. we should all do um, to make our relationship stronger, healthier, happier. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably the first one that I, and I'll do this with Kelly every day, usually over a glass of wine, mm -hmm. um, I'll debrief with her and I'll ask her what's going on, what's been stressing her out. Uh, wow. And then I will tell her what's been stressing me out. But what's absolutely vital is that the listener has to empathise with them, mm -hmm. side with them, and never fix. So you can never give out solutions or advice. you just got to be in their corner. Mm -hmm. And that's something that if you do that every day, it just builds this sense of real team. Mm. Like, it doesn't matter how stressed I am, I can bring it to you, you've got my back. Yeah, see, that's the hard... Who tends to fix, you or Guy? Guy, he's the fixer. So, you yeah. just got to say, darling, love you, but this is a listening conversation, yep. not a fixing conversation. Yep. But I feel like that's a bit of a man thing, they just want to... Oh, yeah, men, yeah, no, I put my hand up. I'm, yep. Like, imagine I see couples, singles throughout the day in private practice, I'm dishing out advice, then I go home, Kelly says, I've had a terrible day, girlfriend she stood me up at the cafe and I'm thinking I'm gonna give advice but then I catch myself and say what a tough day mm -hmm. and if you can do that then your partner's going to feel much closer mm. if you fix basically it sabotages that process so guy no fixing stop it thank you another thing uh, I would say is that when you're bringing up issues you've got to bring them up softly because mm. 96% of the time, the way you start a conversation is how it's going to go. So if you bring up the conversation with, oh, why do you always, mm. you never, Jules, mm -hmm. if you do that, basically the person will get on the defensive, it goes bad. Yeah. So bring it up softly. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, darling, look, I, I just, I'm uncomfortable about what happened the other night. Mm -hmm. That's the way you want to do it. Uh, hellos and goodbyes are really important. Mm -hmm. So before you leave, you always kiss your partner goodbye. And when you come home, Rather than going to the dog, the cat, the kids, go straight to your partner mm -hmm. and kiss them and say, you know, hello, how was your day? Uh, it's very important because it prioritises them. Yeah. Another thing is um, try and saturate your relationship with five positive interactions to one negative interaction. Okay. So compliments, praise, gratitude, mm -hmm. doing the errand, unloading the dishwasher guy, that sort of stuff. If you do five of those... Yeah to one negative comment. Mm -hmm. What happens is, because it, it saturates the relationship, you start getting this positive perspective. Mm -hmm. You give your partner the benefit of the doubt and everything really seems pretty rosy. Yeah. So that's a really easy oh, tip to so do. That's so good. Yeah. All of that is so good. Yeah, so these are the things that um, you can do. They're not very big. Mm. Um, but the way, I, the way I say to couples is, flowers once a month doesn't cut it. Mm -hmm. Do little things daily and often and that's what will build the bond. Yeah. It's also important to prioritise sex too, mm -hmm. once a week. Once a week? Yeah. And Is you've that got the bare two minimum? types. What's that? Is that the bare minimum? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's where you want to kind of, that's the sweet spot. Okay. Oh, wow. You know, because cause you've got two types of sex. You've got desire driven sex, mm -hmm. where you rip the clothes off, kitchen table, nobody's around, you're just in the mood. Yeah. And you've got decision driven sex, which is mm -hmm. more Friday nights, our night. Mm hmm. And so whether it's desire-driven or decision-driven, it doesn't matter, but try and prioritise it mm. because it's just another way of kind of um, connecting and you're saying to your partner, you know, what we have is something special above and beyond anything else that's out there. I've got friends who have an, a no-rejection rule. So Interesting. if one feels like it, then yeah. the other does yeah. and vice versa. You, 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 yeah, and the no-rejection rule. Another way of saying that is the why-not rule. Oh, so yeah. if you start to get an all-amorous... Uh, guy says, why not? Mm -hmm. 
And that then basically means, or vice versa, you're constantly in that stage where, yeah, okay, if we start, it's probably going to feel pretty good. Let's go with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and what that means is that, once again, it's going to prioritize it more than couples because I see a lot of couples where the, the sex is really, you know, it hasn't been happening for months or even years. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, they're not going, oh, that's another thing you can do as a couple, go to bed at the same time. Really important. Yeah. And just while we're on that, uh, don't undermine each other in front of the kids. Yes. Because how old are your kids, Jules? Just turned five, about to turn three. So very, we're, we're, we're kind of still in the trenches a bit. Yeah. Six and a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you if you've got a problem with what your partner's saying or doing, have them on about it softly later when the kids aren't around. Because they do. They absorb everything and they listen and they... Yeah, they do. They kind of, they sense things. Yep. I'll tell you another one just while I'm on it because I'm on a roll now, George. You've got me I talking. I am loving um, this. With couples, we always make bids for attention, yeah? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so what we have to do is make sure that we catch them. We have to turn towards our partner and respond back when they're making that bid for a, a connection. And one of the biggest issues that we have in today's world with couples is technology. Mm. So you can imagine when you're talking to Guy and Guy's sending a text away yeah. and he's not looking at you and he's not responding, that's going to wind you up. Mm-hmm. Because uh, you feel rejected, not important, like, what, what, I don't matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, for everyone out there, you know, make sure you rein your technology in. Mm -hmm. uh, and when your partner speaks to you, whatever it is, always stop what you're doing, respond back. How do you react to someone who's on their phone not responding to you? Probably tap them on the shoulder because they're not responding at all. I don't even know if they've heard you. Uh, and say, hey, look, you know, I'm trying to get your attention here. And say next time, when one of us, either one of us is on the computer, on the phone, whatever, we've got to stop what we're doing and respond back. Mm -hmm. um, because couples that are really good together are constantly connecting. You're so right. It's the little things. Yeah. Everything I've talked about here, uh, you can do, uh, and it doesn't take much time at all. But what they've found in science is that, you know, when they've looked at couples that do really well, they do all these things. Mm. And couples that are falling apart and in crisis, they don't do any of it. Right. You know, they might give flowers once every two months. Yeah. Or go to Fiji for a holiday, you know, middle of the year. The rest yeah. of the time they just argue. Right. So it's little things daily and often that mm -hmm. make such a difference. Yeah. So little daily rituals are really important. So me and my wife, we will uh, get up in the morning and make each other a coffee and sit down on the couch. We probably only get 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. Wow. With little kids, that's really um, good. Maybe a little TV for the kids yeah. while we connect. Okay. And we think, well, you know. What's better, us having a connection and feeling like, right, now we know what's going on for the day mm -hmm. and I know about her and she knows about me and then watching a bit of TV versus missing each other for days, could be weeks, yeah. and not connecting. Yeah. Kids catch stress. Mm. So if the couple is really good, strong, chilled, the kids are chilled. Yeah. Uh, whereas when we're not connecting, when we are resenting each other, missing each other, then the kids are going to pick up on that and they're going to play up. So I always think, you know what, I'm going to prioritise my wife over the kids. Mm. Some people might not like that, but yeah. it doesn't worry me. That's what I do. And I just think, get the relationship right, the kids will fall into line. Wow, that's huge. We might get some trouble on that, right? What about for our single friends? A lot of singles out there yeah. and there are a lot of ways to meet people now online mm -hmm. and through apps. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, Jules, but I, like, I don't know where I'd begin if I was single again. No. I feel like I've really never been on a date <laughs> because I've just always known well, guys. Well, Guy was that good. <laughs> it was like, well, that's game, set, match. Yep, just saw him across McDonald's one time and that was it. <laughs> that's romantic. I'd like to talk about that, but uh, I don't, another that's another day. time. Yeah. yeah for, so for singles out there, I think one of the things that I've found is that a lot of the singles that are out there that are frustrated are single because they're putting up obstacles and they don't know it. Mm. And when we watch Married at First Sight, you know, after a while you realise that's why they're single. And that's why it can be a powerful experiment because they learn that, they change it, and they move forward. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of singles out there that will do things that, you know, um, hold them back and they don't know it. Things like what? Well, one of the biggest ones is their mindset. It's very negative. So they will say, uh, there are no good ones out there. Mm -hmm. I'm too old. Um, mm. I'm bad at relationships. So they have this mindset going in that it's all over. Mm. 
Mm. And um, that makes it very hard because you put out a vibe there and it's very difficult to meet someone with that type of mindset. Um, I think also some people really struggle with exes. Uh, they're bad at boundaries. So mm. they are looking for uh, the right partner, but they're spending all their time with their ex. Right. Uh, or they've got uh, this problem with uh, their family, for instance, where they've got really overbearing parents that are so involved in their lives and telling them what to do all the time that they really can't free up to meet anybody. Mm. Then you have those people that are extremely picky. Uh, we had one guy on this recent series of Ma Married where you know, he had a list, a huge list, of things that he needed in a woman, which included small earlobes. And, you know, Ooh, there's a point where so you've got to specific. say, look, um, that list, that <laughs> that pickiness is holding you back. No, I'm just thinking Hold about my earlobes. No, great earlobes, Jules. <laughs> I checked those out just as I sat down. Uh, it's one of those things, though, where you need to stop when you're in the dating game, if you're frustrated, and say, am I doing anything that's holding me back? Mm. And I often say, get a friend, sit down with them, get a couple of girlfriends and say, you know, what feedback can you give me? That's brutal. You know, because they might say, well, look, Jules, you know, you do tend to chase too hard. Mm. You send a lot of texts. You get very clingy. You put them on a pedestal. You make them the centre of the world. We don't see you for two months when you're going out with someone. Mm -hmm. You've got to change that up. Yeah. And so when, when you realise there are some obstacles, I'm going to change it up, it really then frees you up to get into the dating game and feel a lot more kind of relaxed about it. That's not to say that people with those sorts of things going on don't not hook up. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, they do. That's a very good point. They yeah. hook up, but often what it means is they get into a toxic relationship right? and the same pattern mm -hmm. occurs. So they'll sit down in private practice and say, I can't meet the right guy. Um, I keep going out with a bad boy. you know. Yeah. And so we have to then look at what they're doing, how they're feeling, um, and how they want to date differently. And, and overall, what I would say is that you date at the level of your self-esteem. Hmm. So if you feel bad about yourself, you're going to tend to gravitate to people that don't treat you well. But if you feel really good, then you date up hmm. and you'll, you'll gravitate to people that are really healthy and, and kind of uh, respect you. So a lot of the work I do with singles is around self-esteem and assertiveness and picking that up and understanding what yeah. to avoid and what to go towards. I yes. must have been feeling really good about myself when I dated a guy. And that, that shows. So interesting because I do have single friends and I, you know, like you never know how to answer those questions. As it's, it's very, um, it's hard. There's a lot of pressure out there for people to meet, fall in love and, you know, settle down. And so if you're into your 30s and you find yourself that way, often what can happen is you just put this huge amount of anxiety and pressure on yourself. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is generally what, what happens then is you make bad decisions. Mm -hmm. So you meet a guy, you think, well, he's not a great guy. Um, you know what, he's got poor friends, he drinks too much. He could probably lose 10 kgs, but I don't want to be single, so I'll go yeah. out with him. You just do it for the sake of ticking the box. That's right. Yep. You're much better off being single. And waiting. Waiting, for happy. The right I like people um, being selective, mm -hmm. yep. you know, and putting up, you know, the bar high. Yeah. Um, because, you know, frankly, I see couples that have married, there have been people that aren't in love, they've settled, they've had kids, now they're miserable and they're wanting to break up. I 100% agree with you. Mm, so it's, don't settle. It's so much better to wait. It's harder to be married to the wrong person than it is to, to wait, I think. But you've got, to, you've got to be disciplined about it and keep reminding yourself that, you know, um, you're being selective, that's why you're single, mm. uh, and that you're waiting to be inspired. Mm -hmm. And you haven't found that guy yet that's doing that. Amazing advice. I'm loving this. I just look at it in a very practical way, you know. Um, if you're single, you want to look at kind of lifting your self-esteem and then doing things in your dating approach which gets you someone who treats you well. Mm. And with relationships, you know, when you're in it, you want to do things, practically speaking, that create a sense of closeness. What, a, what about relationships that aren't romantic so yeah. friendships yeah, yeah. say how do you know when it's a bad friendship or toxic mm. and yeah. you need to get out or yeah that's if right it's a good friendship yeah i think what i would say to that jules is that you will know um what that friend's like uh by how you feel 
whenever you think about catching up with them. Hmm. So if that friend is a bully, for instance, and you think about catching up with them, you start to get nervous. You kind of feel like, oh, I don't really have a voice around them. I'm kind of scared of being around them. That's a bad sign. Or if you've got a friend who's like an emotional vampire who sucks you dry of everything. Yeah. And you think, and you, and you feel, oh, I'm going to catch up with them. Oh, this is going to be a burden. I'm going to be exhausted here. I'm not going to get home till, you know, two o'clock in the morning because they're going to have me up all night. Uh, that's a sign. Mm. Or if you're catching up with a friend and you don't trust them and you feel like you're on guard. Right. And that you've really got to be cautious with them. You don't know where you stand. Those feelings are really important to tap into. Yeah. They're telling you whether the friend is there for you and is good or whether there's someone who you need to move away from. Mm. How do you move away from somebody? It's more about just reducing contact and letting it fizzle out. Right. Um, that's how people tend to do it. You could have a conversation with them, mm. um, which can be a bit awkward. But um, either way, whether you sit down with them or you just let it fizzle out, ultimately, you don't want to be around people that don't make you feel good. No. What would be your hope for people in relationships? What is, what, when mm. people come to you for advice and they're sort of in despair, I suppose, they, they don't know where to turn, they don't know how to fix it, what would be your hope for those people? I would say... Jules, that every couple that comes in that sees me in crisis uh, don't spend enough time together. They miss each other. And that as a result of that, they're arguing, they're in gridlock, they resent each other. Mm. So my real hope for all the couples is that they decide, you know what, we are going to shake our whole day and week up and prioritise each other and start doing little rituals that essentially fill the cup up that get us seeing more of each other, which then means we're going to talk more, which then means we're going to have each other's back more and debrief more. Uh, it's going to create a greater sense of closeness and friendship, and then from there it all moves. And I'm just going to end it mm. on a married at first sight question. Yes. Do you recommend that people go on this show? I do. I absolutely do. I uh, love the show. I think it has the potential for putting you uh, in touch with your ideal partner. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of science out there that tells us what makes for good couples. And so if you're single and frustrated and not sure how to meet someone, I would absolutely say this show can be ideal for you because through the experts um, and through what the experiment gives you, you can come up, you can come out the other side with happily ever after. It's great. I'm, I'm glad you're doing it, and thank you for, for giving it's, us something to talk about. It's been a pleasure, Jules. <laughs> I've loved this. We've, uh, we've gone sort of into all sorts of areas, I've haven't we? Honestly, I feel like this has been therapeutic, and I've gotten <laughs> a lot of good advice. And I'm you can take, take home. some home to Guy. 100%. Uh, not that he needs too much, but um, a couple of pointers. Yeah, just a couple. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming here. Been a pleasure, Jules. Thanks for having me on.